Chapter 11, Part 2. Faster than I had ever moved in my life, I went to work. With a stick, I measured the water in the hole where my feet had broken through the ice. I was right. My foot had touched the bottom. Eighteen inches down, I felt the soft mud. With my pole, I fished the lantern back to the bank. I took the handle off, straightened it out, and bent a hook in one end. With one of my shoelaces, I tied the wire to the end of the cane pole. I left the hook sticking out about six inches beyond the end of it. I started shouting encouragement to little Anne. I told her to hang on and not to give up, for I was going to save her. She answered with a low cry. With the hook stuck in one of the ventilating hooks on the t holes on the top of my light, I lifted the back out on the ice and set it down. After a little wiggling and pushing, I worked the hook loose and laid the pole down. I took off my clothes, picked up the axe, and stepped down into the hole, into the hole in the icy water. It came to my knees. Step by step, breaking the ice with my axe, I waded out. The water came up to my hips and then to my waist. The cold bite of it took my breath away and I felt my body grow numb. I couldn't feel my feet at all, but I knew they were moving. When the water reached my armpits, I stopped and worked my pole toward little Anne. Stretching my arms as far out as I could, I saw I was still a foot short. Closing my eyes and gritting my teeth, I moved on. The water reached my chin. I was close enough. I started hooking the at the collar of little Anne. Time after time, I felt the hook almost catch. I saw I was fishing on a wrong angle. She had settled so low in the water, I couldn't reach her collar. Raising my arms above my head so the pole would be on a slant, I kept hooking and praying. The t seconds ticked by. I strained for one more inch. The muscles in my arms grew numb from the weight of the pole. Little Anne's claws slipped again. I thought she was gone. At the very edge of the ice, she caught again. All I could see now were her small red paws and her no nose and eyes. By old Dan's actions, I could tell he understood and wanted to help. He ran over close to my pole and started digging at the ice. I whooped him with the cane. That was the only time in my life I ever hit my dog. I had to get him out of the way so I could see what I was doing. Just when I thought my task was impossible, I felt the hook slide under the tough leather. It was none too soon. As gently as I could, dra I, I dragged her over to the rim of the ice. At first, I thought she was dead. She didn't move. Old Dan started whining and licking her face and ears. She moved her head. I started talking to her. She made an effort to stand but couldn't. Her muscles were paralyzed by the, and the blood had long since ceased to flow. At the movement of little Anne, old Dan threw a fit. He started barking and jumping. His long red tail fanned the air. Still holding on to my pole, I tried to take a step backward. My feet wouldn't move. A cold, gripping fear came over me. I thought my legs were frozen. I made another effort to lift my leg. It moved. I realized that my feet were stuck in the soft, muddy bottom. I started backing out, dragging the body of my little dog. I couldn't feel the pole in my hands. When my feet touched the icy bank, I couldn't feel that either. All the feeling in my body was gone. I wrapped little Anne in my coat and hurried into my clothes. With the pole, I fished my light back. Close by was the large drift. I climbed up on the top of it and dug a hole down through the ice and snow until I reached the dry limbs. I poured half of the oil in my lantern down into the hole and dropped in a match. In no time, I had a roaring fire. I laid little Anne close to the warm heat and went to work. Old Dan washed her head with his warm red tongue while I massaged and rubbed her body. I could tell by her cries when, when the blood started circulating. Little by little, her strength came back. I stood her on her feet and started walking her. She was weak and wobbly, but I knew she would live. I felt much better and breathed a sigh of relief. After drying myself out the best I could, I took the lantern handle from the pole, bent it back to its original position, and put it back on the lantern. Holding the light out in front of me, I looked at it. The bright metal gleamed in the firelight fire glow. I started talking to it. I said, thanks, old lantern. More than you'll ever know. I'll always take care of you. Your globe will always be clean, and there will never be any rust or dirt on your frame. I knew if it had not been for the miracle of the lantern, my little dog would have met her death on that night. Her grave would have been the cold, icy waters of the Illinois River. Out in the river, I could hear the, old, the cold water gurgling in the icy trough. It seemed to be angry. It hissed and growled as it tore its way through the channel. I shuddered to think of what could have happened. Before I left for home, I walked back to the sycamore tree. Once again, I said a prayer, but this time the words were different. I didn't ask for a miracle. In every way a young boy could, I said thanks. My second prayer wasn't just with words. 
all of my heart and soul was in it. On my way home, I decided not to say anything to my mother and father about little Anne's accident. I knew it would scare Mama and she might stop my hunting. Reaching our house, I didn't hang the lantern in its usual place. I took it to my room and set it in the corner with the handle standing up. The next morning, I started sneezing and came down with a terrible cold. I told Mama I'd gotten my feet wet, and she scolded me a little and started doctoring me. For three days and nights, I stayed home. All this time, I kept checking the handle in my lantern. My sister shook the house from the roof to the floor with their playing and romping, but the handle never did fall. I went to my mother and asked her if God answered prayers every time one was said. She smiled and said, No, Billy, not every time. He only answers the ones that are said from the heart. You have to be sincere and believe in him. She wanted to know why I had asked. I said, Oh, I just wondered and wanted to know. She came over and straightened my suspender, saying, Well, that was a very nice question for my little Daniel Boone to ask. Bending over, she started kissing me. I finally squirmed away from her, feeling as, the, as wet as dirt dauber's nest. My mother could nev never could kiss me like a fellow should be kissed. Before she was done, I was, all I was kissed all over. It always made me feel silly and baby-like. I tried to tell her that a coon hunter wasn't supposed to be kissed like that, that way. But Mama never could understand things like that. I stomped out of the house to see how my dogs were.